I always say there's a difference between being liked and being respected. And to the outsider who doesn't know any different, it's not until it's time to do anything where there's real investment, like bringing around the family, bestowing professional opportunities, that you realize that you're effectively a jester or a clown. Progress often requires pain. All progress is, is the result of pushing past what is comfortable. And when you go run and work out, your body's like, bro, like, there's nothing to come hunt us. What are we doing? Chill out. Whenever you see a wall of words, they're trying to hide something. There's the good reason and the real reason. If you deceive yourself, you, you're done. You gotta be authentic. You've gotta be distinctive. So, but if your idea doesn't stand up the logical scrutiny, you have to discard it. I don't think any situation has ever gotten worse because someone has good manners. Whoever angers you controls you. You, you know, man, stuff just not found me. I didn't, I didn't find you. You control your emotions, and when you do that, that enables you to present yourself maximally, and that's the, really the best use of it. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another episode of Infinite Loops. Today, I am delighted to have back on Infinite Loops, one of my original guests when I was just getting started out, Ed Lattimore, who is the proprietor of Stoic Street Smarts. Ed, welcome. Hey, Jim, it is good to be here. It's great to have you. Um, wow, a lot going on in your life. N new child, new book, <laughs> like, what's going on? Yeah, new, new, you know, the, the past three months, well, really more like the past five, uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll split the difference and say four since he's four months old. So, um, the last, the last four months that there, there've been a lot of big changes. I have a son, um, really excited. That's, that's been a very, this is a fun experience every day. Like, like, once you accept that you're never going to sleep a full eight hours again or if i do like i don't know when that starts again uh but once once you accept that that is kind of the cost of doing business then then everything else just kind of falls into place like, like my gauge whether whether we had a good night is did i sleep two hours or four hours before i had an interruption and if it's four hours that's a good night that, that's that's two that, that's a block where it'll come up to be eight hours typically because it takes like like an hour and a half to everything between changing and feeding. If it's two, I'm well, probably gonna wake up a little, little grumpy. But, but, but that's been been fun. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I strongly recommend every every man do this because it is it is a great focusing tool. And not that I had like any problems with that because I, I did a lot of work on my life prior to getting to this point, but. Uh, it, it's just taking things up a level. Like it, it's very easy to look at something and go, that's not worth my time. Like, like no matter what the long shot is, that's not worth my time. I never turned down podcasts before. Never. I, I like now almost all of them. I'm like, nah, I like, I just can't do it. Like you don't have the, and, and I hate to be that guy where I'm like, you don't have the audience. We don't have the relationship. Uh, or you're just starting out where I'm like, we're just gonna pass on this for now. And, you know, if you're interested, not to sound like a, like a prick, but if you're interested, come back. Oh, uh, we we a little <laughs> step, look, and it makes more sense. But but there's that, uh, and and it it forces me to make a lot of smart decisions. And then the the new book is is really that's a crazy experience. Um, and you you've been published by a House before, so uh, I don't I don't know how how different things are because we're in two different sectors of what is published but i i did not have any inkling of a i mean i've always wanted to, to have my next book be one published for the house and we go all the way back to september and i was just talking to people about this being my dream and my next goal and and, and one of my my um a guy whose show i'd actually been on he said hey a friend of mine who's an agent, she's putting on a class on writing proposals. So I said, sure. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking this would be a good way to get closer to somebody who can give me where I need to be. But I also need to learn how to do this. About halfway through the class, because of how I think, I was like, you know, let me start asking people I know and asking around. So I talked to everybody about, you know, every everyone I know who's got a book deal. 
uh, I just asked them like what they did and how it worked out. And that led to my web guy going. Well, oh, I also designed Jimmy Sonny's website. Jimmy Sonny wrote this book, The Founders, about the, the founders of PayPal. Yeah, Jimmy's so good friend. Yep. Yep. Okay, so so you know Jimmy, great. So I talked to Jimmy. Uh Jimmy and I hit it off immediately. Great, great guy. He's like, you know, I know you, you he gave me the ins and outs. He's like, I know you really wanna publish with a house. Uh, but but given your your reach and everything, you know, still don't put out don't put off the this uh, publishing. And he sends me an article, and the article is by Financial Samurai uh, Sam. I, th I think it's hilarious. Sam's Asian, and his, his handle was Financial Samurai. That tickles me every time I I talk about it. But when I read the article, I go, "This is good stuff." And I thought it was so good, I would share it on Twitter. I share it on Twitter. Sam hits me up like five minutes later. He's like, "Hey man, I hear you're writing the book. Uh, if you have any questions, hit me up." So we have a call. I tell him what I'm trying to do with my idea. He goes, cool. Let me introduce you to my agent. Well, at least what I, I thought that's what he said. Because because Sam doesn't have an agent. Sam works directly with the with, with Penguin Portfolio. And as a result, the person he put me on the phone was Noah Schwartzberg, you know, the chief editor over there. We, we talked and he goes, all right, send me over some of your threads and some of your, your best work. Uh, uh, a few days go by, he goes, oh, man, I got some great news. Everyone here, you know, Nikki Papadopoulos and Adrian Zeigman, we're, we're all really excited to bring you on. We think Poor Fellow could be a great place for you. Uh, but you need an agent. So they introduced me to Howard Yoon or Ross Yoon, uh, agency down in D.C., and the rest is history, mostly. Because when I got with Howard, he's like, I think, because I had wrote this proposal for the class, he's like, you know, I think you have a better booking you based on everything I've read. So while the kid is here in his first month, uh, and I highlight that because everyone will understand how ridiculous and taxing this was, the first month I, I rewrote the proposal and, and ended up making it longer. It ended up being about 70 pages. And it was, it, was, it was a very difficult thing. In fact, when I think about like moments where like in my memory, I'm tired, there's when I was in school and fighting at the same time, and this, like that was was hard, but but it ended up being well worth the effort. And and having an agent, I can't underestimate or I can't overstate how awesome that is because his job is to sell me because he don't eat unless I eat. So he not only is giving me the best advice, but is helping me re rewrite this. Like going in, checking tweets. He read through my whole website, took my best stories, and and put those in the appropriate places for the, the chapter outlines. And when we got a pretty, pretty good deal, I, I'm, I'm very happy with the deal now. So yeah, now is, now is the next part where it's like, Oh shit. Now I got to write this, <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> but, but it's going to be fun. I am, I'm thrilled and I'm thrilled because I'll be doing it in my new house. Uh, that was the other thing because, you know, now that we have this person and look, me, me and Anna have been together 11 years. There are no accidents when you're with someone 11 years. There are unplanned events, though. <laughs> and he was very much an unplanned event. Uh, so much so that we had actually literally, like, we found out she was pregnant. Oh, man. Is that like, like April? Like the end of April. I want to say like April 20th or 30th. And we just resigned our lease on our two-bedroom apartment. And so we were like, well... This will work for, for now because he is he is immobile and plus most of that time she'll be pregnant. But now, like, I mean, this guy's doing he's rolling and he's not crawling or anything. But but in by the time the summer comes around, yeah, like we just need more space. And on top of that, no one no one tells you about this. You you lose like 50% of your living space to kids' stuff, kids' toys everywhere. And and that's cool because it's great because well but but at the same time yeah, you gotta have more space so we needed more room she wanted an office because of uh, her work like we both work at home which is is really a blessing I'm learning because a lot of guys don't get to see their kid nearly as much as I do which I'm I'm learning and it, it's awesome like like I know his hunger cues and apparently guys become like clueless about this shit like oh is he sleepy is he hungry. Uh, they come home and it's like, well, I just put them to bed and I don't have to deal with any of that. And I'm really grateful for it. So, yeah, that, that's kind of in a nutshell. It's with the, the big three things that have been happening that consume so much 
of my time and energy and my sleep too. Uh, well, I can tell you the three days that I remember like they were yesterday was the birth of my three children. And then the next days that I remember almost as vividly is the birth of my grandchildren. So I can definitely say it's a great job. It's the best job I've ever had being a dad and a grandfather. And uh, so I think you're going to make a great dad. Let, let, let's go back to the book for a second. You, you said you completely rewrote uh, the premise of the book. Can you take us uh, through where you started with it and, and where it is now and, and how it changed? Okay, so you you, you have to you got to remember something when you when you're dealing with uh, something that is tailored to a group as opposed to a one on one approach. Uh, if if you do it long enough, you learn that there's some things that just you need to put in place, and you need to put them in place because because if you got a bunch of horses roaming free on the pasture, uh. Yeah, that, that might be cool for the horses, but but eventually, you know, you gotta you gotta do something with these guys. You gotta ride them, gonna you know, corral them up, whatever. And so it's a lot better to put those boundaries in place to begin with. I say this to say the class was structured uh kind of to hit the bell curve of people who would be or in the middle of the bell curve of people who'd be looking to publish. From what I understand, very rarely. Does someone in my position end up in that class? And when I say my position, it's, you know, I have the platform. I have the, the, the sales to show I can move books and everything like that. I have the name. Like, like we're not dealing, I've got over 200 articles on my site. Like, like we're not dealing with uh, someone who's green behind the ears in the writing and marketing side. So a lot of the advice given was, or our instruction given was to to produce a piece of content that would that wouldn't be too far off, but but wouldn't really take advantage of of certain um certain spe specificities. You know, one of the things that led me to so, so for example, the first thing we did in the class was put together the comparative titles, and we were instructed to put together books that had a what was it? A sales rank on Amazon of higher than 150,000 and had been published in the last 10 years. And that's generally good advice from, from where everything I've, I've picked up. The problem with that advice is that there, there's sometimes it's not, you know, what, what I had in mind always for this book was some, what was kind of a, a cross between the art of learning, which is over 20 years old, uh, and and like David Goggins can't hurt me now sort of deal well, with sprinklings of uh, Pressfield. I, I love Stephen Pressfield, and uh, and all of those books are good books that have been proven sellers. But if I follow this advice, I don't end up down that road. And I, I paid, so I'm gonna follow that advice. Uh, and then that thing because it was the first thing I did shaped every decision going forward for how I would structure the book. I'm I'm green. I don't know what sells and what doesn't sell. Okay, uh, so the the initial premise was a book that was more about boxing and everything I learned in boxing and how to apply that to your life. the The new premise is the Ed Lattimore story, and boxing plays a central role in that because it is. It is the the thing that that transformed me and and made me into who I am. But now there is a lot more about my upbringing. There's a lot more about my my addictions. There's a lot more. I, interestingly enough, there's a lot more about boxing now because because I'm not trying to make this book. Here is a concept about boxing that you can apply to your life. It's here's a lesson you can learn about you can apply to your life that is sometimes. Uh, you can you can show how it's been applied or how it's manifested itself in, in the ring and in the stories of fighters and in the stories of myself. Uh, so that's the big change. And then it became much more of a memoir, uh, and and memoir self help much much more in the style of uh, still in the style of about the art of learning, but also 
Can't Hurt Me and Goggins, and also The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. And, and that was not on my radar whatsoever. I happened to have a connection to Mark, and I had reached out to him and asked him some questions. And, and I said, well, if I'm going to ask, ask questions of this guy, you know, he was one of the authors I reached out to. I should read through his book. I read through his book and I said, this, this dude, you know, he's, he's done effectively what I'm trying to do. Like, like in terms of, uh, like the only difference is, you know, the, the stories in the background. One of the, one of the, the key selling points that was brought up is that, you know, that there are people who want to listen to me and follow me and be interested in me. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm neither here nor there about this, but it is what it is because I'm a, I'm a black kid from the, from the ghetto. That makes a big difference. There are people who now can look at me and go, okay, this guy's saying that I can relate and understand that. Relate to and understand that. It's a big deal. Uh, it's, it's a big deal because, you know, I was never a representation guy in my thoughts in general. But I've come to learn and re appreciate the power of that, not just from a commercial standpoint, but but really from a uh, human progress standpoint. It, it's just because, in other words, just because I wasn't that way doesn't mean there aren't a lot of people who look and go, okay, everyone looks, everyone who's doing something looks like this. I look like that. Maybe I should try to do other things. And you take that principle and you apply it to other, other stuff. And I, I just think... Uh, I I have a really good opportunity here to to have a noticeable impact, I think, on on a specific demographic, which are which are young men, because because right now there's a lot of it's a lot of stuff out there being put out there for for young men, and that's not you know the, the, what do they say they say right to an audience, you know you may end up well, with a much bigger audience, and you probably will, but but when I, I think about this, I'm I just I'm writing the book as if. You know, kind of like how I wrote my second book about sobriety. It's the stuff that I wish someone would have told me or warned me about a guidance I would have had because I didn't have my father uh, around to to teach me anything. I, I learned a lot of this stuff the hard way, and I, and, and it makes me really happy. Just on a on a backtracking note, that, that Henry, that's the kid, uh, he won't have to go through that. You know, there'll, there'll be guidance from the very start on things to do, and it's awesome. Yeah, you know. Uh... The reason I was fascinated by and had you as one of my first guests is your your story is like uh, almost like Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Uh, you, you overcame a lot of shit in your life. And as you pointed out, you you didn't have any kind of guidelines or guideposts or or uh, m well, we're going to talk about mentors later because you did find some mentors. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I thought your your books were great. I think your writing is great. The stories about you, your heavy, your, your time as a heavyweight boxer, really, really interesting. But also the the your openness about like addiction. At, at the top of your Twitter, for example, you've got the quote: "Most of the bad things in life can be avoided uh, if you simply <laughs> don't <laughs> crack." <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And it, yeah, nothing you you do really really well is you can get away with a lot of shit that a lot of people couldn't. Like for example, you always are doing the uh, coffee so black at that uh, type jokes. Like yeah, they're <laughs> well, I have a good time with those. They're, they're always pretty funny. But do you do you ever like get any blowback or do you ever get people? No, I, I mean, you know why? Because you know first you gotta you gotta think everything about the fight you're gonna pick. You're, you're picking a fight. Uh, what a guy making a coffee joke, and, and and here's the thing, right? Before I even go there, let let's start point zero. One of the gripes I have when people try to make these jokes because I think the jokes are clever, and and they're clever because my intention is to never uh, denigrate the black experience. My intention is to draw my to draw attention to it. Yeah, and and to and to personify the coffee a bit. And that, that's, that's not, I don't want to say it's easy or hard. It's just, it's a, it's a different way to approach the joke. You know, every day someone will tell me a joke like, coffee so black it has warrants and child support. And I'm like, that's not funny. Like, it's not funny because there is there's nothing uh, particular to the coffee about that that's interesting. There's no play on words. 
but with coffee so black, the cops turn off their body cams when they drink it. That's like that's a different type of joke. That that brings attention to it. Our coffee so black, only three fifths of its calories count. Different kind of joke. And and when you when you make these kinds of jokes, you know what I hope. I have a whole page on my website about this. Uh, what I hope is that I'm able to to educate people who didn't know. Like I have a joke: like, coffee so black, you needed an amendment to mix it with cream before 1967. That that's really specific. <laughs> and so hopefully someone goes and looks up Virginia versus Loving and learn about the mitigation rules in this country. That's my hope, right? Or coffee so black it has to be shipped to the Middle Passage. To get that joke, you got to go learn about the Middle Passage and what that was. Okay? And then you go, oh, that's great. Because some people read it, you know, people who know, they they hear these jokes and they get them immediately. That's the goal with the jokes. But do I ever get blowback? No, because that's the kind of joke I try to tell. Where it's not just mean. Right. And and I've, I, I believe deeply that you can often change more minds if you're entertaining and funny a little bit, even about things like, you know, there's a whole slew of Irish jokes, right? That, uh, and, and the history <laughs> and, and the history of the Irish uh, and, and the world, you know, no Irish need apply. Um, and, and, and gentle humor. And, and, and I also love the idea of the specificity of the several you just mentioned, like, if it leads people to say, I wonder what he means by that. I mean, like, yeah, there, wait a minute. There was a law. My oldest sister was married to a, a black man and that was in 1969. And like, even then, right after. Yeah. yeah even, still, so. even then, like his name is George. And he was like, you know, there's certain states we can't even go to. And when you think about how much at least this country has changed in many respects for the better, like that's one of them. But oh, for sure. Like <laughs> we, I think about this a lot because because Anna's. I mean, it depends on the day how I'm feeling. Some days she's white, some days she's Portuguese. It depends on which one, you know. But but, but to to the average one look, they have no idea where she's from. She just looks like a white person. Uh, I think about that. No one bats an eye about it. It's not a thing anymore. And and even when I was growing up, that was a thing. And I'm not, and not, not like an illegal thing, but it was a thing that was commented on in culture. And you, you, you catch flack for my mom didn't like that that I had white friends. It was weird to me. Um, but I, but then you know, you go, well, my mom grew up in the '60s. I, it's a different perspective. But now, you know, now it's like if you hear somebody say something you're like, yeah, they still make you like like a Betamax or something. Like you're like you're a relic. You don't <laughs> belong. Because we've changed so much. I agree. And and I think that's one of the things that I'm like really positive about in is particularly the United States. When you look at where we were, like when my sister got married, for example, uh, and where we are now, I mean, and other things too, like I, in 1971, a woman couldn't get a credit card in her own name without her husband's approval. Right. And, I mean, th- when you see that, it just kind of blows your mind. At least it does mine, right? Like, what? How the hell could that? Weird world. <laughs> right. It's just like, and and so I think a lot of these changes have, have definitely been, been for the better. Um, let's talk a bit about addiction, because one of the things that you point out that I don't think a lot of people think about is you point out that, hey, you could be addicted to the normal shit, right? Like you could be addicted to alcohol or crack or blow, but you can also be addicted to things that are ostensibly good for you. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, here's the thing. Like, if I was to define ad- addiction and, and not like go and consult the oracles of Google or whatever, um, I would say that you're addicted to something when, when you no longer receive, uh, when the when the cost of engaging in the activity exceeds the value mm. uh, that that you receive from it. Because because one thing I absolutely believe, whether they, well, whether it's a good choice or bad choice, and most of the time it's a bad choice, uh, is that everyone every addiction starts from a place of 
of um ben- benign meaning. Like 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 oh, I'll put it put it like this. No one ever, you know, smoked crack and plans to become a crackhead. Like that that's not how it looks. like we know that's the outcome, but but no one ever plans for that. No one ever takes a drink plan to become an alcoholic, you know? So that's the when when you when you look at it that way, then you then you can start understanding or you you change your framework on how you interact with individuals who are doing it with addiction because then you gotta ask yourself a question, and it's the hard question, why is it that some people become addicts and some people don't? Even the same activity. Uh, you know, I have a buddy, man. He he smoked crack like three times and was like, "Man, this this shit ain't hot. I just don't like." It. Which is crazy to anybody who has the, the preconceived idea. Well, what a crackhead is. You're just like, ah, this ain't for me. Uh, you know. But also, the other people, man, it, it's like they smoke weed one time and their life becomes about weed. And we we know. Here's what we know. Oh, there's a famous experiment uh, called Rat Park. And in Rat Park, they, they did what they do to rats. Which is they fuck with the rats and they put coke in the water and got the, the rats hooked on coke, right? And pretty much, and, and it was a choice. It was like, you know, press this lever for some coke, press this other lever for some food. And they chose the coke overwhelmingly. And then they turned into to, to crackheads. Like, destitute and Strung out, the health was terrible. Everything you would imagine would happen to somebody gets hooked on narcotics. And then they did something novel to test this idea. Instead of having the rats isolated, which is how they were doing it, they put them in a community. They gave them things to do. Uh, they weren't just rats hanging out in a cage being a rat by himself. It was a bunch of rats for the community and a thriving party to work with. And lo and behold, most of the rats did not become addicts. We we can we can extrapolate this, you know, the, forget the the rat study. I guess when the GIs came back from Vietnam, oh, I guess over in Vietnam, man, they were they were shooting smack the way people shoot cigarettes here or smoke cigarettes here. Uh, and and when they come back, I think there was only twenty five percent that stayed addicted, which is. Which sounds like a lot, but that's significant for something like heroin. And they looked and saw, and you know, these guys are back around their families. They're back in their social circle. They have they have outlets for stress. They have people to talk to. So what I found, and and, and this certainly cooperates with my experience with, with me and alcohol, is when you don't have a community, when you don't have people you trust. Uh, when you haven't developed your emotional coping skills, uh, are your skills to to connect with people? Ah, oh, you you are you are prime target for addiction because you're using it differently than the other person. It might seem like it's like like I think back to when, when, when me and my friends all started drinking when we were eighteen. Perhaps we're all doing it to have fun, right? But underneath that, why do some guys, you know? not go crazy other guys are like okay that's cool and other ones are like me it's it, it you know i'm the one with no support network at home no family I maybe mean, i think about this a lot like in terms of my son uh we're here with her family here in florida right now but i don't i don't interact with my family i don't know right <laughs> i mean it's not it's not really there i interact with my sister there's, there's, there's no one else there and there, and there wasn't anyone there it's, so if you want to, if you want to understand uh, the addict, it is really important to understand why. Because all these substances, like anything, once you, once you accept that anything can become addictive, it may not induce the same physiological changes that that say heroin does. But but I we, we know people are addicted to other things than heroin. When you look at that, then you can go, okay, how did this happen? I, I would imagine that's one of the things that really drove the opioid crisis. Not the opioids themselves, though they make it very easy to get addicted. But but think about what you're taking it for. You're you're hurting and isolated. Likely you're dealing with real problems on top of that pain. Um, you know, no one no one's popping no one's popping an opioid for a headache. Like I mean, at least they shouldn't be. It, it's for for some for some life changing injury. 
And there's likely something that goes along with that. The, the insight into isolation is, you know, I, I research this stuff a lot and that just keeps popping up as like isolation for your average human being, man or woman, is really a bad thing, right? It's so, it, it's so bad that it's a punishment in prison. Yeah. Like, they're like, how, how, do we, how do we do some of these guys that, that ain't been done? We got them here for life. We're feeding them like shit. They got to worry about dropping the show. Oh, I know we'll put them, we'll make sure they're alone. And that is way worse than anything that, that there's prison and then there's alone. And that is crazy. And uh, I've seen some studies that people put in isolation begin to hallucinate in as little as four hours. Wow. And, and, and essentially why that is like a cruel and unusual punishment. Because, you know, we, we I think, evolved to, to be in communities, to be uh, connected to each other. And w when you don't have those connections, as you point out, rightly, uh, that can lead to a lot of bad things. How, how did how did you go about it? Because I mentioned mentors earlier. You you found mentors. You found people to to talk to. And and what was the spark? And what what how'd you decide? Okay, here's what I need to do to do this. Uh, you know, so a lot of it was was thinking through things. Right? It's like, okay, this sucks. This sucks. This sucks. I don't want this to suck anymore. Let me do something to make it less suck less, right? Uh, and and as, every time I revisit my story, I learn a little bit more about, about myself because, because the further you are away from the incident, the better view you have. Like a year out of sobriety, I, I couldn't tell you what worked i'd be like oh, i just white knuckled that shit i just decided i was not gonna drink and didn't drink right three four years out i'm like you know what really helped me not drink having something to do having some goals and that was significant i finally had some goals five or six years out, i'm like you know meeting someone that i really cared about and not wanting to hurt her to have like a high sense of conscientiousness that 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 made a big difference Oh, uh, but, but as I approach 10 years and all of that stuff is still true. Uh, the one thing that, that has really started to stand out to me is, well, well, right after that, right after like me and her, I was like, okay, now I have something to care about. Like I have, I have a goal for my life. I was kind of purposeless. But now the thing that really stands out to me. I always say there's a the the uh, there's a difference between being liked and being respected. And then if you're not used to either one, you can't tell the difference, you know. And for a long time, I tried to be liked. And being liked is cool. Being liked will get you to some parties when people get old, and being liked turns into being a joke. But being respected might not get you invited to a lot of parties. Yeah, but it's a, but but it, you you build real strong bonds. People trust you. People want to bring you around. People will have good things to say about you. Opportunities to find you. Uh, and and to the outsider who doesn't know any different, it's the same as being liked. It's not until it's time to do anything where there is real investment and like bring a fam bring around the family, or, or bestowing professional opportunities on you that you realize that you're just like, you're effectively a jester, a clown. But it's key, they really look the same. What I think happened that drives more things than anything else, and I talk about this in my TED Talk as well, is that for the first time in my adult life, I was building connections with people where, where alcohol was not a factor because it couldn't be. Because I, I, you know, my, my story, my, my first day of sobriety is December 23rd of 2013. But from, from June 4th <laughs> until I had one drink where I snuck off base, uh, but June 4th to December like 20th, I didn't have any alcohol. But I made a boatload of new friends and connections, people I'm still cool with to this day. And, 
And for the first time in, since I was easily 18, I was making friends based on me and nothing else. And these were real connections. You're around people all the time. I mean, it might not be the most comfortable scenario, but, but you are, you're, you're, you're developing those relationships, those relationships. And I didn't think about it at the time, but those relationships and wanting to maintain that because, because one, once people will see you for a certain way and they, they start to think you that way, you really don't want to ruin that. If you, if you have any level of conscientiousness, at least, and I think that's luck. I mean, I, I don't know where it came from, but I have a, a fairly high level of conscientiousness. Uh, you, you don't want to, you don't want to drag that up. It's the same trait that had to go, you know, if I mess this relationship up, I want it to be because I'm an asshole. Not because I got drunk and said something or because I was, I tried to cheat on her because I was drinking. Like, no, let's have it be because of me, because she's a nice girl and doesn't deserve that. And then that, that comes from like recognizing uh, our ex birth experience with, with the words, but then recognizing your role in things. Or what is your responsibility? So yeah, all that, all that comes together. And, and I say, I would say the relationships you form, uh, that really, that helps and that helped me. On top of everything else, I mean, I just look and there's just multiple reasons. That's why, I, I mean, I just can't imagine going back at this point. I am, I'm sure in 15 years, it'll be because, I mean, well, at that point, you know, people started, you started paying me to speak about drinking. I can't drink, you know, but, 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 but probably not. You know, my, my point is that I just, there are lots of reasons and, and the, the more, the more removed I become in time, the more I think those reasons have to do with people rather than internal like drive or willpower. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, your your comment about being liked versus respected I, it rings very true to me. People sometimes confuse or confabulate words. Like I, one that bugs me is there's a huge difference between being nice and being kind. And and people say, oh, you're so nice. And I say, oh, no, I'm not nice at all. <laughs> I do try to be <laughs> kind. <laughs> And, and, and they're very, very different things. So I think, you know, having somebody like you articulate these differences can like be really helpful because, you know, just, you know, just hearing you say that just now, right. There's a big difference between being liked and respected, which is going to be better for you. I think people listening are going to be like, oh yeah. Wow. I, yeah. I never, thought, I never thought about it that way. One of the other things that you write a lot about in terms of mindset, self-improvement, et cetera, is resilience and uh, I would add ag agility, uh, your ability to kind of, I think one of the things you wrote was, you know, try to try to think strategically from a kind of a game, God view of the game, right? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't tactically, don't feel the need that you have to respond to every fucking thing. I personally, I think that's like the best advice anyone could actually live by. If I could, you know, just give one piece of advice, you don't, uh, need, uh, you, you don't need to react to everything, right? Which yeah. obviously is probably informed by, uh, you know, the name of, of your substack, the, the, the Stoic Street Sparks. How did you, how did you get into Stoicism? You, you know, man, Stoicism found me. I didn't, I didn't find it. I, my, my mom was a, was a real motherfucker when it comes to emotional uh, manipulation and and I I figured out very young that the only way to deal with this, the only way to win is to not play the game kind of deal. Uh, I because I couldn't because the, there was a way she wanted me to respond, but but there, there were like trap questions. I'll give you a perfect example. This is a story that like I tell people this story. It's just hilarious, and, and it's not what she did when I was particularly young either. I was twenty three. I came over and she said, she said, um, I got arrested for stealing from John Eagle. And, and I said, and John Eagle's in the supermarket around here. And, and I said, well, well, why would you do that? And she looks at my sister and I go, see, I told you he believed I did that. And I'm like, why would I not believe you did that? Like, you, you know, kind of deal. Or when we were younger, she'd ask us to do something. 
And and if it took too long, she would go, never mind, I'll just do it myself. I don't I don't need you guys' help anyway. And I'm like, okay. And so I I I learned very early that I could I could let myself be drawn into this type of, of ridiculousness. Or I could be non-reactive. And that non-reactiveness developed at home crossed over into the rest of my life because my my life out, outside of my home certainly until I was 14 and then then there's some big changes outside of my home what was just as chaotic and ridiculous and unpredictable and so having something to to uh, I, I figured it, I, I can't be like swayed and knocked out like I don't feel good being emotional in general, because I know that's when people do really stupid stuff just from, from life. So I figured out how to play that game. And then it was only, you know, in my, in my 20s that I was like, oh, there's a name for this. Uh, and then, then I read more into it and I go, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This makes sense. This makes sense. The And, and the Stoics don't outright uh, oppose this, but this is like the only place where I am, where I'm likely not a, a pure Stoic. And I think it's a really important place. I'm a really big fan of of understanding how to how to relate to people. Uh, you control your emotions, and when you do that, that enables you to present yourself maximally, and that's the best way. That's really the best use of it, aside from like your own sanity. Uh, but like when you talk to people, where all people who are even a little bit sensitive are a little bit aware, reckon, recognize that. The, the way you approach a conversation is going to affect how the person feels about the conversation with you. And if you can make a person feel comfortable, you can go a lot further than whenever you get them on their back foot, you get them feeling anxious or nervous. That's only possible if you control your emotions. Like, uh, especially if you're dealing with something uh, volatile, something that can make people angry, uh, that you, but you got to talk about it. There's a way to talk about it, and there's a way to not talk about it. And, and that kind of emotional discipline, that's what I think is the real value of stoicism and that it allows you to have a lot more fun as a person, which, which sounds, sounds counter to the, to the central concept of stoicism, I suppose, but, but I'm not, I'm not like a pure stoic. I've, I've, I've never claimed to be, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, uh, that was his name, the Vulcan on Star Trek, uh, Spock. Spock, yeah, I'm not, I'm not like Spock, you know, but, but you know, but I'm definitely not a clean on. No motherfuckers are crazy. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, w one of the, there's a great line that is, whoever angers you controls you. Yeah. And, and, and I figured that out. Oh, so early. And, That's and how did you do that? How did you figure that out? Um, you know, you just man, you know, as I write this book, I'm learning a lot about, about adverse childhood events, ACEs, they call them, traumatic experiences. And, and what, what children of traumatic experiences figure out is, is they figure out how to protect themselves from the threats. It's just a natural thing all humans do. They're not big, so they can't fight, but they're not idiots, so they can learn and figure things out. And I figured the best way to protect myself was like, because I could take an ass kicking, whatever, right? Uh, and eventually I got so big that those stopped because I, I started trying to ass kick back. You know, you're not going to hit me out of nowhere. Uh, but but what, 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 where the damage came is, is, you know, feeling like I'm being stonewalled and, and degraded at home. Like, it's one of those things that my, my mom hated that I talked about this part of my childhood because to her, it was all hunky dory. And the fact that we didn't end up in prison, that, that was a success, right? That was her metric of success. I didn't end up in jail. Jasmine didn't end up with any kids out of wedlock. And I'm just like, you know, I know you, you, you tried your best, but there's some things where your best is not good enough. And I think, and, and not only that, I don't believe you tried your best for, for, for many, many reasons, but my my method of protecting myself in this environment uh, was was I couldn't I wasn't gonna let her see what could that affect me emotionally because I felt like it would be used as a weapon against me.
I got a buddy on, on Twitter, uh, Bobby Dino. He, he, he's got this, uh, he goes, never let them see your buttons. Like, don't, don't let them see what can make you mad. And it's a shame that I figured that out with my mom. But but it is what it is. And, and look, I, I never had a problem talking about well, my mom or anything like that to the point when she was alive, she died last December because she wasn't around to know that we were, she was going to have a grandkid, which is which is crazy to me because it was like the big thing. She was like, I want a grandkid. And I'm like, well, you got to take care of your health. Died at 59. All completely avoidable. Stupid shit. Really did boy. But um I um I would write in my newsletter and one day she wrote me and she was like, I'm going to unsubscribe for your newsletter because I don't like how you're painting your childhood. You know, was it so bad? Ever so I'm like, objectively, and we have the I always said to her, I would go, look, let's let's talk about facts. And if I have lied, I will rescind them. And she and then she never liked that conversation because there was nothing to rescind, you know. But well, because look, at the end of the day, uh, I, I wouldn't. It, it certainly, here's the thing about growing up in the hood: mess with you because you get to see all all levels of the shit. And there are some people who are just about to break out, and there are others who are like. You know, child, you need some protective services are going to be here any second. But most of us are somewhere in between, you know, of those two extremes. But it's still a really bad place to be, and you got to be a certain type of person to end up in that situation. So I used to, you know, I had to, one of the things I had to deal with for a long time was like, you know, feeling like, you know, what well, was it really that bad? You know, compared to the people on the other end, no, it wasn't. Compared to people in the upper end, even in the projects, it was pretty far ago. It was bad. My sister, uh, my, my sister, well, I'm 38. So my sister's 35 now. And it's only been recently after my mom passed that she's able to like come to terms with a lot of stuff. And, but she used to say, you know, it wasn't even that bad. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, okay. And now she's like, oh, okay. Some things you were well, wrong with that. And she was this way. And I'm like, yeah, you know, the, the difference is my path. Uh, took me to a completely different part of life, completely different socioeconomic background. I just got to see different things. And and my sister didn't. So she didn't know how messed up things were because she never really spent time around people who are like that. But from the ninth grade on in a different classroom or a different school I went to, you know, I had friends, my, all, almost all of my friends, if you know, all of my friends had had both parents living at home with one exception. His dad died when he was 12. Uh, and so, like, just that environment, it's different. They all live in the middle-class neighborhoods. You see a different way of living and, and interacting. The parents were very involved. Uh, they hadn't been arrested or anything like that. They, they didn't live in this environment. So I got to see all that and, and got to compare back. My, early, my sister never... Not till later, not till much later now where she's spending time around me and seeing how things turned out for me in my life. And also like doing my mom in her last days and the afterwards, is she able to like honestly go, okay, you might not have been so crazy. Like, no, I was just aware of things. That's there's a big difference. You, you know, there there's a, a saying that it goes, if you sit in shit long enough, it stops stinking. And <laughs> oh man. You know, I, I never heard that one, but it's true. Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm going to add that to the repertoire. <laughs> I thought of you when I was getting ready for this, and I thought of that line. And and obviously, you you, you had a catalyst, right? You, you were like, no way. This is, this, is not, I, this is not the way my life is. I'm not going to play my life on passive mode here. And, and so you did boxing. You got a degree in physics. You you started a super successful Substack. Your books have sold really really well. Like you mentioned, your sister is is now that your mom's gone and and she's and you're and she's coming to kind of terms with oh yeah, Ed you you were probably more right. Like did 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 she like watch what was going on with you and say, hey maybe maybe I should be doing something similar or. Not well, sure, but you know, I, I really think that, and and now she she has. I mean, I, I'm really proud of my sister because you know when she was 23, she went 
and did something dumb and got she pled down from a felony to a misdemeanor. It was simple. She was she pled from aggravated to simple or simple to, to aggravate it. Uh, so uh, and, and that's significant because it, it, it caught one and it got her kicked out the Air Force. But it also prevented her from doing a lot of stuff and, and making progress in her life. And she just now at 35 uh, got the OK from the nursing board that it would be OK for her to, to, to nursing school. Because like you can attend any nursing school, but she works at a hospital where she was going to get a tuition uh, waiver. And they were like, well, because, because you don't have to apply, we're, we're, not, but we're also not going to put you in this program if you can't get the license. So you have to find out. And she they they looked at everything she'd done over the past shit, 13, 35, 12 years. And uh and they were like, all right, you're good. You learned your lesson. I mean, I think that's crazy how long it took. But um things that are looking up, they're they're better. But um I think that the the thing that oh, so when you don't know something or you don't have any experience. I sometimes forget how challenging it can be to do something completely different, especially when you, if you, I don't know, I don't know if she identified, but let's, I'll give her the, the benefit of a doubt. The doubt would say she did, which was, you know, change her entire social circle where she spent the time and, and her approach to life. Uh, I don't, I just think that there was a lot of, because all her friends are friends from childhood, from the neighborhood, which means they're all people who came up with the same ideas from the same background and continue to perpetuate with what's marginal improvement of them. So she doesn't get to see anything new and anything different. But now, you know, she, she's over, certainly over the past two or three years, since, since we moved back from Portugal, definitely, uh, she spent a lot more time over over at the house and around me. And I think that that's really helped her uh, ha be motivated to make changes and do things. You know, another thing you, you talk a lot about is um, you, that progress often requires pain. And do, do, do you think, do you think progress is possible without pain? I think pain is a feeling. And that feeling is telling you uh, uh, that something is wrong. This is this is key here. And when you decide to make progress, you, you have to remember what you're doing and really remember what the goal of all organisms is. To find the most energy efficient configuration, uh, we can just sum that up. It's kind of homeostasis, to find the best place to get the most for the least. When you decide, to, to to skedaddle, to start making moves towards something that requires more energy than you're you're currently using to survive. Uh, this this is a problem, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, a, it's a problem to your to your system. But it's like, yo, how are we going? You know, first off, this is comfortable. I don't know why we're moving. Uh, secondly, how much energy? How long is this going to take? I don't know if we can we can do this. Uh, maybe we won't do it. Maybe we won't just chill out. But all of those things together, uh, when you start making progress, when you start growing, because of those those two scenarios that kind of work together, you leaving behind something that is comfortable and also going after something that will cause discomfort if for any other reason that it is new and unfamiliar, then you're going to experience pain. And we'll use discomfort as a synonym as well. The pain it sounds um it's too intense, but they they the, the idea is the same. That whenever you start to make progress, you're going to experience discomfort, displeasure. It th there's gonna be like you know, you're just gonna hear over and over again, why are you doing this from and maybe not that, but it's like like we were good. It's like you ever you know, like when you go run and work out, your body's like, bro, like there's nothing to come hunt us. What are we doing? Just chill out, you don't need to run. And you're like, nah, man, I really got to do it. And your body's like, okay, but what I'm telling you, I'm going to keep hurting until you stop. <laughs> and then and then you finish, and your body's like, I told you. And you're like, wait a second. But you read as far as you said you would. You tricked me. I'm not going to fall for this. And then over time, you just keep doing it every single day. 
And before you know it, you know, you, you made a little progress, but that, that pain, whether it be, whether it be physical in the sense of training or emotional, in the sense of working on your development, um, and really that, that's the hard stuff, you know, your, your relationships, putting yourself out there, our mental learning, a brand new skill. Yeah. It's like, well, we, we're alive. So what are we doing this for? Why? It's very natural for an organism to decide to expand and more energy than it needs. No, nowhere else in nature do we see this, which is why no other creatures have created cities and cars and shit, right? Because all the like, like we were fine walking places. Uh we were even fine riding horses, and somebody came along and said, I got a better idea. Why don't we make this engine thing? And then, you know, flight and all that. So all progress is, is the result of, of of pushing past what is comfortable or deciding it's not good enough. You know, that's also a pretty good metaphor for society, right? It's like uh, Tony DeMello, uh, the philosopher, wrote that every everybody wants uh, progress, but everybody hates change. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so it seems that, and your reference to homeostasis, it's like, it seems like society uh, as a whole uh, really kind of acts like a person in that regard, right? They... They, they, as you point out, hey, we were fine walking, and then <laughs> and then, well, wait a minute, there's a train. I like that. That's better. Oh, wait, a yep. car? Oh, a plane? Yeah, but like, what on the individual level? How? What did you do? Like, if you were trying something new, when you just were like, you know what? Fuck this. I, I just don't want to do this. How? How did you psych yourself up? Or, or did you not? Um, well, when, well, when everything were... I do, I'm, I'm very good. I think better than the average person, and, and I think, given your line of work, you'll, you'll agree with this general statement. Humans are very bad at the future. Yeah, it is, it is like this thing that doesn't. It's weird how we treat it. We, we treat it like it's never going to arrive. And, 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 and then when it does, if we accept it, we think it'll be exactly how it is now, which, which is effectively the same thing as treating like it's never going to arrive. Right. Um, and so that, that's why everything from, from saving money is hard for people because it's like, well, would I do that? You know, I, I said, well, I have money now. Won't I always have money? Like, <laughs> you know, kind of deal. Um, and and so for me, I just thought about my future. And and when you think about your future, uh, I'll let, here's here's the other part. Let's say a person is good. What is why they're not good? Whatever a person imagines the future, they imagine it in the best case scenario, and they start making decisions based on that. Well, that is a terrible practice because well because most times it doesn't happen that way. And secondly, because you're preparing for an event to give you more than what it actually will, you're going to make your, your calculations uh, and you'll end up in a spot of scarcity or a point of scarcity uh, and lack. What I'm good at doing, way better, probably to the point of a fault almost. I'm not, I'm not a pessimist by any means, but I'm very good at looking at how things are going to go. This is going to be a problem. Like, like, and if I don't do something about it, it, it is going to, and then plotting that I don't want, or what I got to do now and everything like that. Like, like when I joined the army, I had a very specific plan. I probably relied too much on things going well, uh, which, which it almost backfired on me. But the plan was, you know, and, and I said in five years, am I going to have more options or fewer options? How many people do you know, ask themselves about five years in the future? It, it, it's, it's uncommon. And so I said, all right, I'm going to join, go back to school. That was the plan. So I said, but, you know, worst case, I'll be able to get a job so I can stop working at T-Mobile. Uh, that was the, the plan. But it was, it was a five-year plan. And I could imagine how bad it would get if I didn't succeed in my plan. I always kept that in mind. Negative forecasting. I was like, all right, let's avoid that. So with negative forecasting, that's... um. But I, I did really well. And then I said, all right, what do I have to do to avoid this scenario? 
And if I can't avoid it, how can I prepare for it? What's the best way to get myself ready for what is coming? You know, um, the uh, negative forecasting, my grandfather taught me a thing called premeditating. And it was uh, it, almost exactly as you've described what you do. Uh, essentially, it's you, you think about like, I want X, right? Whatever X happens to be. And, and then what you do is you write out all of the reasons why you think you want X, because this is leading into, we, we, we share a mutual love of writing because of its powerful effect on our lives. Uh, but with premeditating, essentially, first off, you write it out to determine, A, do I really want X, right? And, and then you continue with the exercise like, okay, so here are all the things that might happen if I get X, and here are all the things that might happen if I don't get X. Some of the times when you're writing it out, what you discover is, oh, holy shit, it's better if I don't get X. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You know, a little funny, funny story about that. I, I remember when we were we were going to find out everything about, about Henry being born, I was like, man, I really hope we have twins. I'm so happy, like so happy the universe did not grant me my wish. <laughs> I just, I, you know, this is, this is already hard enough or busy enough. I would never describe this as hard. Uh, I describe it as very busy and time intensive. But, but when I put one down, he goes, he's down. And then I got to worry about one when I wake up and it's just one. <laughs> but there were, two, there were two of them. Like, oh, all right, well, I would have got what I wanted, you know. <laughs> But I, but I always like to say in reference to that or similar to that, I say, you know, never be so sure what you want that you won't take something better. A, a lot of people, uh, they they get fixated and because they but they don't work out like you said, they don't work out what the gains and the losses are. They don't work out what it might cost to get that. I deal with this all the time talking to guys, uh, kids at the boxing gym. They come in, they're like, oh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be a uh, uh, be a star. I'm gonna make all this money, and I'm gonna do great. I'm like, slow down. Most of you are not gonna make money. Most of you will not be good enough to to even win a national title, let alone any significant money. And and even if you were, there's not that much money in a sport anyway. And then I go, look, I break down the numbers, and I say, really, if you want if you want to do this for money, just go get a job. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And they're like, that's not what I wanted to hear. I'm like, I'm just, I'm keeping it real with you. But look, best case scenario, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, and you're pleasantly surprised. But worst case scenario, if we follow your advice, or best case for you, uh, is is most likely that it won't happen. You know, it, and you're like, well, I, and that that's a thing that happened to me too. A lot of a lot of people at the time, my coach included. He couldn't, I mean, I, he understood, but he didn't like that I was in school and boxing at the same time. And yeah, it, it probably did take away from how good I could be at this fighting. I know it took away from how good I could do in school. But I said, I know that, that, that boxing is a high opportunity cost event. And once it's over, I've got nothing else. So let me make sure I have something else because, because that negative forecasting, I call up the, uh, the fighter's graveyard, where, where where you get a bunch of guys that they put all their effort into their career and they went as far as they could go for whatever reason, which usually isn't very far. And so now they they coach guys, they 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 got to work at a gym and then they got to have a night work a night shift uh, job because because most guys that fight they're not you know they're not putting off medical school to to box. It's not not really that kind of thing. So. I said, I didn't want that to be me. And so it's not me. Because most guys, when they stop fighting, uh, it, it is, um, it's a rough, rough world. When I was going through my, my publishing contracts, I, I made a post on Facebook where I was like, man, this is like, like I compared it to a boxing contract. I was like, you know, they're paying me a lot more money for a lot less risk. <laughs> like, all I got to do, all I got to do is write this book, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about writing for a bit, uh, because I know that you and I have really similar thoughts about it um, and the power 
of it. Um, you know, writing turns thoughts into things. And yeah. it it is an active, it's an active uh presentation of what you want or think you want, but it's actually you putting it into the world, right? And even if you're just writing it for yourself, it's still putting it out there where you can see it and it's getting it out of your head and like that whole premeditating um thing. What one of the things that you also say, which I also totally agree with, is you gotta be authentic, you've got to be distinctive. Um it did remind me of the Groucho Marx uh, quip that was, he said, the secret of life is honesty and fair dealing. If you can fake those, you've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you, how, we all seem to like really have built in bullshit detectors, right? And, and it becomes pretty obvious to us when other people are like, fronting and yeah yeah how how do you when you're listening to somebody reading somebody whatever how do you like immediately grab on to oh okay this person is the real deal um you know it, it's for for starters i never try and make that assessment in, in a in an area where i am inexperienced mm. this is not it's the you know, won't work. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. Okay, so but when I am reading uh, about someone or engaging or interacting with someone because I'm, I'm in a gym so much, I, what, you, what you want to look for are things that are very hard to fake. And there are, and here's what's hard to fake: the lingo. A lot of times, the lingo that's used is that that'll tell you everything. If if a person just says, I was talking about this the other day where I could like tell what somebody's like from the street. And and it doesn't matter how old they are, because because the the, the kids today are using different words than I use, they're using different words than than my 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 you know uncles use, whatever, right? But it's the way those words are used. It's it, you know what the what the best example of is I gave it is you ever when you listen to somebody speak the Queen's English. They're going to say some shit. You're like, I don't know what that means. But overall, you can tell English is still their first language. Because of how they use the words, where that word should go. And because of that, the context, you can figure it out because of the way it's used. Because you, because you both speak English is your first language. If you speak suburb is your first language. And you come to me talking about something on the street. You're, you're like it's gonna be it's gonna be very hard. You're, you're gonna like, you're gonna slip up, either in usage, lexicon, your terms aren't being a little dated. Where I'm like, how old are you? You, you start hearing these things, and you go, okay, that's that's off. In terms of like experience, there's some things that people don't glamorize or talk about. It's not, um, it's not really. It, it would be weird. And you hear them and go, oh, that's an odd thing to talk about. Unless somebody's like messed up. Uh, and, and like I like a good, good example of this is if, if like somebody starts talking about, let's say they're trying to blend in and they start talking about, about their baby mom or something like that. And okay, so far so good. And he mentioned something like, you know, uh, she, was, she was cheating on me or whatever. My red flag would go off. I'd be like, and and it wouldn't go off like you're a freak, but it'd just be weird. Like who the hell said like baby mom and cheated? Like she was running around with some niggas, like something like that. Like like there's a there's a way to a way to say it. It's just that you wouldn't say it that way, you know? It'd be like where are you from? Uh, that kind of deal. Interestingly enough, man, boxing is supposed to be like this battalion, our, our last bastion of a real honest, because there's there's the independent system. Box rec, and then there's still a heavy word of mouth system. Every now and then, you'll get somebody to come around, you know, talking about they uh they have they fought they got they got a record and it's just not loaded. And I'm like, okay, um, let's get in the ring and see you do something. And you can tell immediately, like, 
that's one of the cool things about about fighting. You, there's no laws in boxing, man. Like, like everyone is like between the connection aspect. Like, like every I, I went to a gym to meet my buddy to just go work out with him when I was in Vegas, and and they had to the door like I was like I was serving a warrant, and they weren't, and I was not within my rights to enter the property because it wasn't signed properly. I had to mention who my coach was, <laughs> and like. Because he was like, you don't look familiar. Because I've been fighting like seven years. Like, you don't look familiar. I don't, I don't know your name. You fight. But like, yeah, man, my coach, whatever. He was like, he looks and like, okay, cool. And I'm like, wow, man. That, that's how it is. Uh, so so you you get used to that. And you you start figuring out who is who is full of it. There's a great scene in The Wire where I don't know if you're familiar with the show. Oh, I but, love The Wire. Yeah, great show. Okay, great. So, so there's a great scene. Uh, when Stringer is trying to to go legit and he's trying to get the money to build up the properties and get them done. And or he's trying to get them done, period. He's already put the money in. But they keep but 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 Clay Davis keeps taking them for more money, more money. And then the one day Avon is there and he's explaining everything to Avon. And Avon is like, look, man, I don't know anything you're talking about. But I but I, but I know he pretty much says like I know I know bullshit when I hear it. Like and he's you know has no knowledge of of how real estate or commercial real estate works. But he knows nonsense when he hears it. When he like after a while you start start hearing it and it's like, okay, so why is that relevant? I always say, you know, you're being deceived when stuff that is relevant isn't mentioned and stuff that's not relevant is emphasized. And and that that's a that's a, if you want a good metric, that's probably the single best one. And also like you know Jay James Oldinger has this great test where he says there's the good reason and the real reason. And when you when you get used to uh, filtering things through that, 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 whenever someone talks to me about their problems, I go, okay, that sounds like a really good reason because otherwise, like, why can't you do this? Like, I talked to when, when I'm done with that, talking to Anna, she's telling me about clients that she, like, you know, why they're giving her issues. I'm like, okay, is it, is it, is it, you know, do you want, do you even want to do this? Let, let's start there. You know, if you don't want to do it, that's the real reason. It's got nothing else to do with anything else. And then from there, you know, you, you can, you can figure out a solution because if you deceive yourself, you, you, you're done. And that's the best way. So, so sum all that up, things that are emphasized that don't need to be, uh, and things that are ignored that need to be emphasized. And from there, you, you can figure out if someone is giving you a good reason and a real reason, and then generally a difference between the two is the real reason is, is the reason that it sounds less scientific because <laughs> people, people would like to lean on facts. It's a lot easier to say, Oh, you know, they're late and they keep giving me to run around and, and, and it, it's going to cost this much than it is to say, I just don't want to work with that dude. Like, I just don't want to do your podcast. Like that's, and that, that's hard. But sometimes that's the only way to do it. Otherwise, you know, because if you keep giving the, a good reason, what you do is you keep introducing areas for a person to rebut you. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay, yo, th that's a bad day where you keep going, I'm um, tied up. What about this time? Oh, okay. Oh, you don't have a uh, Zoom? We can just do a phone call. Oh, you don't have a phone? Look, man, we'll do this by letter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. I love, you know, and, and I, I have a similar maxim, which is whenever you see a wall of words, they're trying to hide something. They're trying to obscure something from you, right? Yeah. Like, like with the whole uh, collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, right? You saw this huge wall of words when there was <laughs> a very, very simple explanation for why that bank collapsed, right? Yeah. And 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 so I I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that one from you because uh, the 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 good reason and the right and the true reason. I love that. Um, you know, another thing that I, I read a lot about you is like, people say really, really nice things about you, which is great. And, you know, outstanding leader, great example, internet dad. How, how do you feel about being kind of cast as the father figure? Look, man, here, here's how I think about this. 
Power of war is a vacuum. Something's going to take my place. And if you don't, and look, it's either going to be me or it's going to be someone with worse intentions. Because I know my intentions. Um, and and I think they're they're clear, but I know my intentions are or X, Y, Z, you know, you can look at my life and see, like, I'm not going to be promoting a degenerate lifestyle or anything like that. I'm going to be promoting, I'm going to be promoting, you know, what I know and what I do best and, and how I live and what people want to emulate. But, but this is a big problem in the male role model space right now. There's a lot of guys, you know, first of all, there's a lot of, the, 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 the male role models are the, the role models that men have for lots of reasons, let's forget the, the media side of it. They're they're terrible, and guys feel like guys are more or less being treated, certainly by the education institution, like defective girls. And you can look at this, and you, you can see this in the the numbers of uh, guys that are being diagnosed for ADHD versus versus girls and we were expecting there to be a rise and that rise would be linear but it's it's a lot higher and, and, and guys the girls uh guys don't have the support networks necessary but they don't feel comfortable with that and we see this in the rate of suicide and men we there's another stat i i have because I, mean, I made a presentation about pretty much how how guys are being being treated a certain way um but but it all comes down to Someone, uh, guys need a lead. Humans in general follow someone, right? And they're going to follow the person they want to copy and emulate. And then whether that be through proximity or through what you have, you have to, you, you will be followed. So for me, that's fine. That's fine because I think you could do a lot worse than trying to do what I've done. I <laughs> think you could do a lot worse. Um, <laughs> And so, and then on top of that, because I'm so, because, because of that consciousness, man, I'm aware of that and I can't shake that. So, you know, that, that keeps my behavior in general. Uh, I think it, it, it helps me behave better. But the, the point is that I, rather than, than act like I don't have influence, I go, I have influence, let me use it for something good. Hmm. You know, so. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good way to think about it. Um, so like, what's next? You, all, all of the, you've got the book, you've got a son, you've, you're, you you're doing all this stuff. Like, uh, do you have some more books planned? Uh, a bigger... so, so I'm going to, I'm going to get through this one. That's the, the, there's something about a contract and a, and a due date and all that that just makes it feel more intimidating. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to get through this one. And while I'm working on that one, because because I know that because my goal is to sell a million copies. I think that's that possible. So I put together, I just been working diligently on different aspects of said marketing plan to make that happen. And I'm starting now because the book realistically at the earliest won't be out for another two years. So that gives me two years to build up a big old marketing channel and distribution network. By distribution, I mean of ideas, not like the product, they handle all that. Yeah. So that's the next thing. I and mean, that that means, you know, some video content, things like that, or, or maybe even a podcast, uh, things of that nature, because because you want to be able to you do you you have to get the book seen and heard by people. You know, I, I think, you know, they, they got these guys with these big old lists that they get signed. Because because that's I mean, I start study where I can and, and, and learn what worked and you know Freaking James Clear had 450,000 people on his list when he signed the deal. And I think Mark Manson had 250. And I'm like, well, I'm not quite there yet. But but I know that I can get there quickly. Because look, man, I cut my teeth in the internet marketing game, which is which is an interesting uh skill set to bring along with actually being able to write and not just rehash and nonsense. So that that's going to be the fun challenge over the next over the next two years is to continue to build this out and develop it. Uh, and, and other areas of my life, um, we'll see how much energy this takes. But but I think I'm going to fight 
again, maybe take one or two fights. Uh, if for any other reason, I just, uh, but, but not heavyweight fights, because fuck that. I'll never fight a heavyweight fight again. Those guys are behemoths. <laughs> I shouldn't have been fighting heavyweight fights in the first place. <laughs> but, but that's kind of how it ended up, and I just happened to be a professional during the transition era. So uh, try a cruiserweight fight or two and just have some fun and, and see where that goes. And I understand the media marketing machine. You want to have a good, cool story. Guy who's 40, I, well, I won't be 40, but uh, I'll be very close to it, uh, who is who's winning fights and wrote this book. Ah, there we go. That's how you get in front of some people. That, that's how I think. And on top of that, I've always wanted to try. Like, I just know more, a lot more. Boxing's weird. It's not just physical. Physical is this. The last part, you got to have stuff up, up here, too. So, oh, there's that. And and I'm, I'm really working on, on my chess game. That's uh, that's always important to me. I think, you know, one of my one of my goals before I die is to get a title. And and I I, I, think I should be able to get a title. I don't, I don't know why I wouldn't be able to, but I got to have to do it right and go about it. But I'm always working, playing on chess.com and working my game. And... And this year, it was the, the last goal. These are the goals. These are my goals. Like, this is how I, I'm like an artist, man. I'm not like a crazy business dude. Um, and, and I want to sit and take the, um, the, the Spanish B2 level exam. I've been preparing for that. Because that would be cool to be like, hey. Like, because I, I can, like, use my Spanish and get around. No one would ever, like, you can drop me to any place that they speak Spanish, and I'm going to be okay. Uh, but, which is like B1 level, but B2 is like a stretch. That's like, am I going to be able to read books and, and watch TV without assistance? Okay. And that, that's, that's hard, man. It's hard because, because your brain has to know things very well. And we don't think about that. I don't know if you know any of the languages, but in English, uh, like this sentence right now, I'm just saying it and you're just understanding it. And there's no translation. Well, you have to get to a point where you're not translating in the other language too. And sometimes you do it. Like even if you don't know Spanish, if you are comestas, you know, you know what that means. Uh, but we add layers of complexity to that and ideas. And it's like, oh goodness. Uh, but but the cool thing now compared to when we were in high school is like the amount of comprehensible input. Like I can like my Netflix alone I could use. Because <laughs> there's always a show. From from Spain and YouTube and stuff, so it's it's a fun game. I think everyone should learn a language, but just it's challenging and it's one of those skills that like you can't beat. it. like I hate the idea of like oh, uh, like like copywriting and email marketing and those are skills. I'm like ah, oh, they're all kind of the same thing and not very hard. But go learn another language. Go fight those those push you like oh, I was my my three. Three step process for male self improvement. And I guess female too. Anyone can do it. Learn a language to be one level. Take and train for, for train and take fight for two years, and live on commission for a year. Yeah, you're like you'll come out of that a a very effective, different human. You like like it'll be way more than just this man as you just know how to fight or know how to sell. You'll know how to connect. You'll know how to study. You'll know how to learn. You'll have to develop grit and perseverance. You'll be a hell of a lot more social and able to connect with people because that's the only way you're like, like, you, like, can I get into B1 level without talking to people and, and overcoming your, uh, your apprehensions about speaking in another language? So, yeah, they, those are, those are some of the goals, man. Nothing, nothing crazy. But, but in terms of the book, one at a time. In fact, you know, we were talking with, before they signed you, you have a, uh, you have a final meeting. Like, they're like, all right, we'd we like the proposal. We like you. Let's just have a talk and make sure. You know, we didn't make a mistake. Like I come on, like I say something crazy or something, right? But during the um the the interview, uh, Adrian Zeigman, the the guy who is the the uh, the, the top dog at Portfolio, he's like my 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 uh, agent brings up the idea of another book, and he's like, let's just worry about this one. You know, uh, oh, we don't even <laughs> let's just get through this one and see how this one goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ed, this has been a great uh, catch up. I'm really delighted to see. You know, the other thing that I wanted to mention is like I, I, I notice when when you list off like what your goals and what you're working on, 
you you choose very interesting and very specific things like chess for example that occup that that requires one part of the mind right to to activate that part of the mind and then fighting you need the mind and the body but that the fighting part activates another part of your mind and then obviously languages completely uh third part so it's like you're doing this whole brain and body development which is really cool i think yeah i think i think it just makes it makes you more interesting in my my opinion like i well, one of the things i learned in my phase of trying to be liked rather than be respected is that people really like interesting people they also respect interesting people so it's it's a good a good um overlap yeah and and so and on top of it like i get cool skills out of it like like i enjoy playing chess and and I get like a cool little thing to put up on my wall, like, oh, you reached the, the 2200 level. Uh, because that, that for me is cool. Like, I really am I'm a big fan of like, I think external validation or recognition of your skills is important because uh, not not for everything, obviously, but you need an independent party to recognize that you you can do what you say you do. Otherwise, anyone can just go around and say they can do anything. And when God give me pushback, um, I go, you know, imagine if everyone could say I got my brown belt BJJ. Or, or that I'm going to talk about, like, no, you, 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 there, that's, a, that's a process and there's a test and everything. You know, just because people think about this in the credentials, they, they have a negative association of what, what people tend to do is when they form negative associations, they write off all the positives. And one of the big positives is that it, it keeps the purity of the the ability to be like, or the purity of of, of the skill set and of the organization or anybody that's affiliated. That and that's like back to that example. That's what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is strive, strove in or strive uh, to do is make sure that it doesn't turn into a make dojo. So like, if someone comes to you and says, "I've been training for three years and I got my brown belt," you will automatically like, like nothing else they say. Will will mean anything to you? <laughs> you Interesting. know. Interesting. Well, one of the things I don't think I was doing this when I had you on the first time, but one of the one of the new things that kind of caught on uh, is that at the end of every podcast, I I uh, say we're going to make you the emperor of the world. We're going to wave a wand, and we're going to make you the boss of the world for one day. You can't kill anyone you can't hurt anyone <laughs> you can't lock anyone up but what you can do we're going to hand you a magic microphone and you can speak two things into it that the entire population of the world whenever their morning their next morning is they're going to wake up and those are going to be the first two things in their mind and they're going to say you know what i'm going to start doing both of those things today what 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 are you going to incept in the world? The first thing, man. The first thing I, I've never heard incept used as a uh, direct verb. That's cool. Um, but one, the, for the, the very first thing I'll do is I'll tell people that that you have to entertain someone's debate and you have to do it with facts, but be polite. So you you, know, you don't. So, but if your idea doesn't stand up to logical scrutiny, you have to discard it and take the better approach. I think if people could could do that, and and maybe that's too extreme because th there's also you know things you just don't like, but but you, you have to admit that you don't have to you don't yeah you don't argue. This is why you just go. I don't like that. I won't do that. Uh, that's the first thing. I, I think I think that would go a long way, and then we can also add to that. Um, hmm. If we could also make sure that people have to treat each other with respect always, like, like no matter what, you gotta be, you you have to be polite. I think you can say. I don't think any situation has ever gotten worse because someone has good manners. Mm. Amen. So, so, that, I, I, I wrote a thread on, on Twitter recently saying, I, I never thought I would see the day where having good manners would be an asymmetric advantage. <laughs> right. Man, <laughs> talk about, dude, you know, and that's one of those things I learned growing up. You, you, can, you can avoid a lot of problems if you just, if you just say my bad. Yep. And just treat right. people with 
respect, but now we're in this weird world and, and it is largely the result of social media. We're in this world where people feel, feel compelled. They can say whatever they want because there's no, there's no, I don't even say, because I'm not going to knock somebody out because they said something crazy to me, but the, the interaction changes. Sure. Yeah. Um, very much so. It, it's such a crazy world we live in. We, 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 I can't remember what it's called in biology, but it's where you get rid of the middle curve and all of the extremes you are represented. And on the one end, you have people uh, who, who only are brave, but or who are all just disrespectful. Cause, cause look, it's not, it wouldn't be a problem if people were polite. Like, like no one would be saying, oh man, social media has made you too comfortable giving people compliments that you can't see. <laughs> like th th that's not the quote. Um, so you get the you get the one end you get people who are just unbelievably rude because they there are no repercussions, and then you get on the other end you have people uh, who who never they immediately they, they, there's no conflict resolution uh, at all, and, and I think those people are more dangerous. Those are the people who. Who start riots and shoot school them. Yeah. Um, and because think about it, you know, school shootings have gone on the rise. Well, when when we used to have when we used to be in the middle, you know, somebody could, could fight it out. I'm not saying that's the, the best thing, but it's a lot better than taking a life. Totally. Um, so that's where we are. And likewise, you get these people on the other end. Um, there was no there used to be there was no cyberbullying. That's like a very new thing. Like it's it's so new that even millennials are like, man, just turn the screen on. Like, it's not really how it works. Like, and, and look, and, and my mind has changed dramatically. It's one of those things I got to think about now that I got to be raising a child in this world. Is is all are all the threats that exist solely on the internet and because of the internet, not that are exacerbated or agitated by, but but cyberbullying is is not like an extension of physical bullying. Yeah. Because an extension of physical bullying will be if they showed up at your house and were like, come outside. We got to, you know, which, which happened to me a few times when I was growing up. All right. This is something new. And, and I guess the best thing is, is where this is going to say, what people understand what I'm saying, understand the data is, you know, I have a son, not a daughter, because that stuff disproportionately affects girls. Mm. You know? And also, I was watching this doc and he was talking about, Oh, uh, we're talking about like the problem of human trafficking in this country. And these these chat rooms and gay rooms are like prone to, to take advantage of kids. And so you gotta you you pretty much I like obviously my thought process is gonna change as, as I learn more and get older. Well we'll see. But but I feel like you, you pretty much gotta raise your kids as if the internet doesn't exist and take it away from them at every chance until they're like 18. <laughs> and look. That sounds crazy, but I, I was a tutor in high school or a high school tutor from from 20, uh, when did we leave, 18? So from like 2016 to 2018. And I'll tell you the best behaved, most adjusted students now in their 20s, their parents had oh, incredibly strict rules about, about the internet and social media. One, one girl was telling me that like, she remembers when she was 14, she got caught with a Facebook and they like took everything away from her for like six months. It's like never again, I can't have one. Can't do it. And another kid I was, she was 18 and because she was 18 and her mom just like had her uh, interact with me to set the meetings up for tutoring, but she wasn't allowed to have a Facebook or Instagram until she was 18. Still like, like so they were even willing to allow her to communicate with an adult via text and adult male, but they were like, you cannot have these tools hmm. so it, it's it's a dangerous world out there man yeah world. well listen this has been great and uh best of luck with the book best of luck uh with i don't think you need the luck but uh with sleep at least for being in yeah. here <laughs> <laughs> and uh this has been great thank you hey thanks man this has been great too